joined here in uh, New Jersey with my buddy Mr. Steve Zing from Samhain Danzig and we're gonna go over some stuff right now and bring you I guess this is part two because we did an interview a couple years ago a lot of things have happened since then and kinda wanna bring everybody up to speed as to what's going on and stuff so Steve let's start right at the beginning go way back what was it like growing up in Lodi New Jersey gassy um, no um, it, you know it was like any other to me it was like any other town um, primarily, you know, mostly Italian, um, but it, was, it had a lot of energy, you know, there was, especially in the music side, there was always, there were so many, so many bands, because there were so many kids and stuff that were playing music at the time, especially in high school, you know, a lot, most of them were cover bands, but there was a lot of, a lot of energy, I think. Now, as a, as a, a young kid, what kind of shaped you uh, you know, musically or like, you know, pop culture, what was going on that kind of just shaped you uh, into the performer you wound up eventually becoming? Well, I hated, I hated the metal scene. I hated anybody that had anything to do with Led Zeppelin or anything like that. I hated the kids who were walking around in high school, who, uh, if they were a drummer. Um, Actually, Chud, I remember, he would walk around with the drumsticks in his back pocket. I despised that. <laughs> it was like, oh, please, stop that shit. It was ridiculous. Sure. Um, I, I was fortunate because I grew up, you know, growing up with uh, Doyle and stuff. He turned me on to a lot of early punk. And I had a cousin who uh, worked for Sire Records. And she brought home the first Ramones album for me. And she's like, I think they want to change the world. I think they want to be the next Beatles. And she would get me all the releases that they would have, uh, Talking Heads and, and stuff like that. So um, I was turned on to punk at a, a really early age, and, and that's what basically shaped my musical, you know, uh, inspiration. So did you start out wanting to be a drummer, or did you just... Yes. Yeah. Um, I actually, I had taken piano lessons um, years before... And I did two years of piano, and I tried guitar, but I had no, um, uh, as Dan calls it, that's Dan over there. Yes. That's my partner, Black Twenty. We're going to bring Dan in, in pretty soon to talk yeah. about Black 29. Yeah, affinity. So, <laughs> but, um, so, because of what Dan describes as that I have ADHD++, plus plus, <laughs> you know, um, I could, I, guitar was too hard for me to learn. I could never really like sit down and really it was too hard sure. so the drums are the easiest things for me because you could bang away so basically I, I um, there was a guy I went to school with his name was Arthur and we were gonna go ride bikes so I meet Arthur at his place and he goes to open his garage door and he's got a set of drums there and I'm like you play the drums he goes well not anymore my mom won't let me I'm like do you want to sell them He's like, I gotta ask my mom. So he asked his mother, and she's like, oh, give me forty dollars. Wow. A real cheap set. Of, you know. sure. sure. So I begged my mother, and she got them for me. And I think it was my eighth grade graduation gift, I think, or maybe even seven. I don't remember. But bought these drums, and I would put a Ramones album on, and Misfits songs, and I would just play every day for that. It was. It was the best thing in the world. So is that the first music you got into was the Ramones? No, well, I grew what I grew up on, you know, I was I was um, you know, seventies pop, seventies AM radio was my thing, you know, that was that's what I grew Cassidy. up on. Well not Sean Cat no, well not really Sean Cassidy, but it was all the you know David Cassidy. <laughs> well, not that I was really into, but you were a product of that whole thing because FM really wasn't that big. Um but then I was into 50s music, okay. and I remember getting the soundtrack to the movie American Graffiti, which was, it, it was like, I love 50s music, mm -hmm. and uh, Elvis was like, Elvis was everything to me. What really wanted me to, what really led me to playing drums was watching Elvis Aloha from Hawaii as it aired. And the drummer, Ronnie Tut, would do these things, and I just was like, I can never. I knew I could never be him, but I wanted to play the drums. So watching Ronnie Tup live Elvis Aloha from Hawaii as it streamed on TV 
that kind of changed my life. And then from there, it led to eventually discovering punk and the Ramones and that yeah, because because if you think of what punk was, especially the Ramones, it was sped up fifties music. Yeah, you know, so was that like so in Lodi? Like you know, take me back to Lodi. Like how was it in terms of like you know was was it like the kind of town where everybody played in you know in a band? Because a lot of musicians, I mean, a lot of you guys, obviously from Misfits, Sam Hain, Danzig stuff came out of there, but other bands. Guys lived locally too. Like I know, like you know, Joel and Turner was from Hackensack, and I know, like there was like other guys in the area. Was was it a big musical? See, area, New, Jer it New Jersey itself was very musical, as everybody knows. All the bands that came out of New Jersey. So I never really played in a cover band, right? So, as a lot of people did, and Dan did, did and, and and I would say in the seventies and eighties cover bands were huge in New Jersey, right? I never wanted to go down that road because as soon as I learned how to bar a chord on a guitar, I wrote a song. You know, and that's, that's, I wanted to be able to, whether it was leave a mark for myself or whatever, I wanted to leave a mark. I didn't want to play someone else's songs sure. but didn't have to. But New Jersey itself was so musical and there were so many bands and so many things going on. When it came to Lodi, you know, I was kind of lucky because there was a, there was a group of people, obviously, you know Doyle and everybody, but there was a group of people that I knew this, uh, that that I I wound up playing with, like like Chris who played in Morning Noise, and uh, his friend Bob Montina who wound up being the bass player in Rosemary's Babies. That was um, Harry Vaughn's group, um, and there was just a whole bunch of people, and we just so happened to be at kind of in the same place at the same time. Sure. So we, we were kind of fortunate. So now Doyle was the first person that you had met from the Misfits? Was he, you guys were... Well, we, we grew together? up together for, uh, from, we're, you know, we're each other's oldest friends. We were, we've been friends since we were five years old. How did you meet? Kindergarten. Just... We, went, so we, had, every, we had every class together from kindergarten through all the way through. And you just got to become good friends and... Yeah, well, we would ride mini bikes together and uh, um, just hang out. And uh, I remember, I remember when um, I guess Jerry, yeah, but Jerry had brought home uh, the Woodstock album, right? Jerry had gotten it. There was something in it where it was like, you know, uh, I, I don't know who it was on the Woodstock album, but it was it was like, hey, you fucking hips, meaning hippies, and me and Dwight was like. Oh. Listen to that. Listen to that. We'd play it over and over and over, you know. But yeah, I mean, it was just it was a real. I think the seventies and eighties were a magical time for music for all different genres, because in the eighties you had what you want to call new wave. You, you know, you, you had the seventies rolling over bands like Sticks and all that stuff. But in the eighties, then you had all these other bands, right? You had the punk hardcore movement that was kind of exploding which really turned into that whole what they call metal today right bands like Lamb of God stuff like that but that was all morphing you know from hardcore you know and like bands like Minor Threat and stuff and then you had the Crow Mags and then there was all these other bands sure. Anthrax and all that stuff that kind of, that to me that kind of all came out of that so it was a it was a it was a great time so when was the first time that you actually heard the Misfits? Oh well, um, you know they would rehearse in, in uh, Doyle and Jerry's garage, and I was in. Uh, we started. Um, we started. Uh, I guess it was 1978, and Doyle came to school and he goes, "Hey, remember? You know my brother's in that band." I'm like, "Yeah." He goes, "You know they're rehearsing at my house after school. Come on by." So I was like, I guess I was maybe 12, 13. And I go in the garage and they launch into, I guess they were playing the Static Age stuff back then. And it completely changed my life right there and then. I'm sitting in a corner in this garage and they're playing. And I looked at Glenn and I said to myself, I'm going to be in a band with this guy someday. And it was probably right before I started playing drums. And 
I'm like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. So that inspired you to play drums? Absolutely. Eventually. I just, I, I just wanted to what do What was it. it about the music that just really... Well, you know, Glenn was very charismatic, if you can, you know, the, the way he grasped the mic and, you know, Glenn was crooning. Mm. He was singing. He was crooning. I mean, it was like, whoa. And the music was just so heavy and the, the sound of, of Jerry's bass and, 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 you know, the guitars. And I think Bobby had just joined the band. I'm not sure if Frank was still Frank was in the band. But it was... It was it, it, the whole thing just, you know, it just grabbed you by the neck, and it was like, like I was like, whoa, this is fucking amazing. It's yeah. like, and it was like the, it was like the heavens opened up, <laughs> the light was shining down. It was like, I got to do this. So when you started going home practicing drums, learning drums, did you practice along to Misfits? Yes, that you did. Yeah, and the Doyle, and Doyle had made me a an eight track tape of all different punk. And, and on it, he put all the Static Age stuff way before it was ever, you know, sure. it was ever released on the box set, of course. This was 78. It was probably right after they had it, you know, had, had it uh, recorded. He had all kinds of punk stuff on there, and I would just go home and play and play and play every day. So at what point it, you started playing, practicing, did you continue to go see, like, their rehearsals? Yeah, and, and, and if Doyle wasn't around, <laughs> there was... So uh, I lived in the apartments, and their there's their house was the first house next to the apartments, and I would sit on this garage on the roof of the garage by myself if none of my friends wanted to do it, and if I couldn't get Joe or somebody else to come and, and hang with me, I would sit on that garage by myself at night in the dark on the roof of the garage. I'd climb up, climb on the roof because the roof. Uh, where the garages were was right next to their garage, and I would just sit there and listen and listen and listen. It was it was so powerful. Yeah, that early stuff is pretty powerful. So you would listen to them. You started practicing that stuff. And at what point did you say, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna now I'm a drummer. I'm gonna do a band. And was the influence to kind of because you did Morning Noise first. Yeah, correct. Was the well? Was the plan we, go ahead to try to be something really similar to the Misfits? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, uh, I have this friend, uh, Mike, who uh, was a singer of Morning Noise. But we had a band before Morning Noise called Implosion, and we played out some shows. We played Max's, and... Oh, no, uh, that was not as Implosion. We played the show place as Implosion. Um, and then we formed kind of Morning Noise a few years later out of that. But, yeah, of course, it was to be somewhat like the Misfits, because it was like... You know, I was, besides 50s and Elvis, I was into Kiss. Kiss was my thing because it's not that they weren't um, great musicians, but it was larger than life. It kind of just, it, again, it, 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 it kind of grabbed you, you know, yeah. where I didn't want to see a, a regular band. Uh, I hate noodlers. I don't like any of that shit. I can't do it. And it doesn't speak to me, sure. right? To me, simplicity. And their stuff was kind of simplistic. It wasn't anything crazy. Oh, yeah, kids are very simple. It's right. Songs, yeah. So, so that's that's what really really got to me. But and that the Misfits to me were like the punk rock Kiss, you know? Because yep. Jerry had the makeup and everything, and obviously Doyle wasn't in the band yet. But but it, it was just kind of you know they had the black leather and the hair in the face and. And I was like, wow, this is so fucking cool, you know? And it, you just wanted to be part of it. That's what it was. Everybody wanted to be part of it. So it was something where in the area everybody started to know, okay, is this band The Misfits? And they started, well, you know. Well, yeah. I mean, I, did they influ I know they influenced Morning Noise, and I also know they influenced, like, Rosemary's Babies. But were they influencing, like, other bands around the area at the time? Maybe some New York stuff, New Jersey stuff? Well, it was interesting because... They were like the New Jersey secret, you know, that kind of would venture out to the city because they, they, they would play the city. They didn't play that often, but when they did, they, make, they made a big thing out of it. They were, you know, they had posters that Glenn would print and T-shirts and everything. So it was like a, a big to-do, and they could, only, they could be playing Max's Kansas City or, you know, um, Irving Plaza or whatever. And they, they made a big deal out of it. But for New Jersey, I mean... Yeah, they, you know, there were bands like uh, Adrenaline OD that were from a few towns over from Lodi, and th while they were more hardcore, 
they would still, I think the Misfits still had an influence over them. So now, uh, with the Misfits, and you were around at that time, was it apparent really early on that, like, okay, Glenn, this is Glenn's vision, Glenn runs a show, or was it the kind of thing where everybody kind of had their own little bit of say into what was going on to create that sound, or was it immediately like, this is my music, that's it, I'm Glenn, I run the show, that's it? I early, did. early on. I think it was all Glenn, and, 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 I, and, and I, think, I think Jerry had not a musical influence, but I think Jerry had the, um, you know, Jerry and Doyle, actually Jerry Doyle and their other brother, Kenny, they were all very artistic. They can draw, they can, they can m cut things and make things look really fucking cool and eerie, and that's what they, that, they were great at that. You know, they still are. So they're more of the performance side. The stage, right. But, the but and I'm sure it was Glenn's image. Because that Glenn, you know, that Glenn never let go of that. You know? He never let go of it. You know, he was the one that started pulling the hair in front of his face. Things like that. Um, but, you know, they were his songs. He wrote those songs. So now, Doyle gets into the band. Doyle becomes a member of the Misfits, and you're close with Doyle. So when's the first time that you actually see the Misfits perform live on stage? I think the first time I saw them was 1980, 88, uh, 81 maybe, in New York. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a Halloween show. I think it was 81. Do was you remember it? Cool. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Every Plaza. <laughs> <laughs> How was it? How was it at that time? I mean, because they, they definitely sounded different when Doyle was in the group. It, it gave well, them a different Do Doyle, sound. You know, Doyle had a raw sound, you know. I mean, he, he had only been playing guitar a few years, and he was put into the band, and, you know, he brought that, where Bobby and Frank, Bobby uh, Steele and Frank Licata had, you know, they were more, um, much more of a, a traditional guitar player, you know, especially Bobby, because Bobby's influence is obviously with Jimi Hendrix and stuff. Uh, Doyle didn't have that. Doyle, at the time, I believe, was just influenced by Johnny Ramone. Yeah. So, you know, Doyle was, you know, the, the, you know, the hammering and power chord and, you know, down strumming. So, um... Were you around when he was practicing this stuff to eventually become... Yes. Well, you, you you couldn't miss it. You, you couldn't you miss hearing him because he would be practicing in his bedroom with the fucking amp on block. It was on <laughs> ten, and you'd hear him down the block. You know. So you knew cool. you knew that he was practicing to eventually become a member of the band. Of course. Yeah, you know. um, I saw them. Uh, I saw them in June at Irving Plaza again. That was with the Beastie Boys. Oh wow! That They're was really in the Beastie. Well, it was. It was when the Beast before the Beastie Boys did their whole uh, rap thing, but they actually at that show they actually started doing rap there, like this hotel motel holiday inn thing they were doing, <laughs> and um, and then I saw the Misfits at the show play, uh, not the show plays, um, uh, um, <sighs> forgot the name of the club in Manhattan. It was down the street from CBGB's. And that was a great show too. Rosemary's Babies was on that, so yeah, it was, it was great. So now you were playing at the time mm -hmm. and doing the morning noise mm -hmm. thing, and they were, you know, obviously having drummer issues. How did you wind up not? I mean, did you ever attempt to audition for them, or, or when they were looking for a drummer, or were you just too young at the time? I think it was too like, young. Yeah, just too young to yeah, absolutely. take a shot at. It. So you never auditioned. You never took a shot no. at it. nothing. So Morning Noise is playing. Did Doyle support you guys and, and come out and see you guys? And, no, because I, I, I never we saw didn't really both we, played together. No, because we didn't really we didn't really play. I mean, we played some places here and there, but it was it was smaller. And Doyle at that point was probably on the road with the Misfits because at that time they they were traveling. They were they were going to California a lot. They were going across the country. So, you know, the Morning Noise thing was a really short, a little window. Yeah, a short window. So. so the Misfits split up, and Glenn decides he's going to do something new. 
but he had actually, I mean, I've read some things where he had already known he was going to leave the Misfits. He was going to put something else together, like Death Comes Ripping, was, he says, was, you know, meant to be a Sam Hain song. So he already kind of had it in his head, or so, at least, you know. At that time, I, I became friendly with Glenn through this guy, George Jermaine, who was an old beatnik guy that we used to hang out with, and he helped the Misfits with, you know, recordings and stuff. And I got to know Glenn, and I had a car, my mom bought me a car, and Glenn would, um, Glenn didn't have a car, he would use his mom's, but then I would take Glenn around to get uh, jackets pressed or whatever, this printer or um, record pressing plan or to New York or whatever. And, plan um, 9 stuff. Yeah, all the Plan 9 stuff. And uh, so Glenn had, um, when, when the Misfits were coming to an end, Glenn had started, um, you know, talking to, I think it was Brian Baker from Minor Threat and Lyle Pressler and um, a few other guys from the D.C. area back forming this super group. And I think Glenn checked it out once and realized that wasn't, you know, they were they were just into wearing, you know, their T-shirts and their, their plaid shirts and going on stage, and that wasn't what Glenn was about. So um, they had finished their... Um, the last Misfit show, and it was the end of October, and they came home, and Glenn called me the next day and said, um, hey, um, that's it, I'm done, I quit, Misfits, it's over. I said, oh, that's too bad, you know, I said, well, I'm sure whatever you do will be successful, so he's like, well, I'm going to do a new band, you want to do it? I'm like, well, sure, <laughs> he's like, and we'll get Erie to do bass. And I'm like, does he replay bass? He goes, well, we'll teach him. I'm like, okay. So, that's what happened. So that was the formation of Sam Hain. Did he already have the name? No. 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 Um, there were, I, I had suggested we just call it Danzig. <laughs> but he said, wow. no. You know. So, I, I, we, had, we were throwing around different... Things. One thing was going to be Glenn Danzig and, and Wolf's Blood. One was going to be Wolf's Bane or something like that. And then um, he brought up Sam Hain. There was a Pagan Halloween and blah blah blah. And then we we're like, yeah, that that works. That works. So, so did at that point the three of you had gotten together. Steve, uh, Steve Glenn and Ari were now the formation of Sam Hain and. You guys, uh, how did you start working on material? Did Glenn already Glenn have was, some stuff? Glenn or? had stuff, and he would come over to my house, and we would just, it was both just him and I in my my old bedroom, in my apartment that I lived in, that I grew up in with my mom, and um, we would sit there and work on stuff. What was the first stuff that you worked on? Do you remember any of the, the, the earliest songs that you worked on? Um, yeah, the, the Howl, uh, The Shift, Black Dream, um, you know, I have um, a four. I had a four-track cassette deck, and uh, I, which I still have, and I have all these tapes of just Glenn and I. And we had this country punk song, that was pretty cool. A country punk song. Yeah. Did it have a title or? No, it didn't it have a just... title. It was just. But I have a whole bunch of different outtake things that from this, the writing session. Yeah, just for an issue. Just sitting there. You get out. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, so the earliest stuff you worked on, Black Dream Shift. Was there anything that you had worked on um, that didn't eventually? I mean, you mentioned that. Was there anything that really went the distance before Initium came out? Where you know, okay, you had the song, you worked on it. It was an actual song, but by the time it got to Initium, you just you dropped it. Yeah, there was a bunch of stuff like that. Um, Glenn was if Glenn didn't feel it after a while, we we just dropped it. Anything so. that you can remember being good or just you know, I haven't even attempted to listen to it all those years later, so I, I don't I don't remember. Why? Uh, just didn't put it. Uh, I don't know. I, just, <laughs> uh, I, I, it's a good question. Why not? Time. You know, it's, uh, it's time. I have to make the time. Got to go to my storage and get my four track out and find. The four track master and and listen to it and yeah just <laughs> dig it up yeah yeah just you know yeah see. it would be fun 
So, okay, you start working on the material, you start demoing stuff. Where did you do, did you guys do uh, pre-production demos for anything? No. Nope. No, it just went You know, right the in. stuff that we, 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 you know, we did in my bedroom. And then we went and, I had found this studio right in Lodi that kind of nobody knew existed. And I brought Morning Noise there and I turned Glenn on to it. And that's how we did uh, Initium there. And uh, we did Unholy Passion and November Cumber Fire and I believe um, uh, Black Area, the first one, was done there. Do you remember the recording sessions? For oh Initium? yeah, absolutely. Anything that you can remember offhand as being like... Did the sessions go quickly? Was it something you read? Because we've discussed before just like the drums themselves being a lot different than your basic 4-4 four, four Kiss, you know, style drums. It was... Glenn, Glenn you know, it was interesting because everybody expected the Misfits part two, and Glenn did not want that. You know, the interesting thing about Glenn is, you know, he doesn't want to be pigeonholed to anything. He's not going to... I don't. Th he doesn't have his formula where you know, like mother. He wasn't going to write a mother part two. That's just sure. not the way he is. He, it, you know, um, but he wanted something different. He didn't want the same four four, whatever that he had with the misses. He wanted it to be different. Do you remember shooting the album cover? Oh, absolutely. Show? Where was that? That was done in his house. It was Glenn's house. Yes, in, in his basement. basement. Yes. My friend Joe Olivetti, um, he he actually, you know, clicked the camera. He was a roadie for Sam Hain. Um, but yeah, we shot that, and uh, we we really only had one chance to shoot it because once you pour that stuff on you, it's all over the place. So what was it? Um, oh, it was caro syrup with dye. So like what Gene used to use. To yeah, use yeah, yeah. Caro syrup. And and but it's sticky, so. Poor Glenn's mom, she had to clean everything. Because we, we had to use the shower there to, to get it off of us, because we were, it was just very sticky. Were there a bunch of shots taken, and, and like you just decided that mm -hmm. was the shot? Yep. So just down somewhere, the somewhere I have all the ones that Glenn developed from that. Yeah. And you just decided that was the shot, these were the mm -hmm. songs. Was there anything recorded during the Initium sessions that wasn't released? No. So the, the the urge song that people talk about was never finished. No. There's supposedly an unreleased track from the Initium Sessions called The Urge, which is supposed to be part of the trilogy. The, of there, songs. You know, if you know, we would start recording stuff, um, but there was nothing finished. So it would have just been an right. unfinished demo. Exactly. Is that the only one? or mm -hmm. That's it. It's just an unfinished Because you got to remember that, you know, studio time... At, at, at that time was quite expensive so we didn't have time to go in and bullshit you know we had to we had to go in and, and get it done was it a quick session like you just went in uh, no, there were there were sessions they probably you know it probably took I mean it's not like we did them every day we did them that when when the guy could get us in so it was a few weeks I would think what's your favorite track from the mission um, probably when we're all got so fun. Nice. So, the album's done, the album comes out, and was it something where immediately, because I know being so different from the Misfits, was it something where people kind of accepted this as, you know, and, and it did really well, or was it, <laughs> there was like a backlash from it, or? They didn't understand it, and the truth, I didn't understand it to begin, at the beginning, I didn't, I didn't get it. I was, again, you know, being a fan of the Misfits, I was like hoping for Misfits Part Two. Bulletters, yeah. And it kind of it grew on me, obviously, and we and we we toured a lot for it. Um, it was again, there were people think, you know, we we would play these shows and people would be screaming, "Mommy, mommy!" Sure. It was like, nope, you're not going to get it. And I think Car Business was one of Glenn's favorite songs, which is why we did a version of it. Um, you know, Glenn's mind was always going. You know, he wanted to always um, write better. So, you know, people, again, they weren't expecting what Sam Hain was about. It was, it was cause, because it was different. 
was he listening to different stuff at the time? Because I know if you if you look at '84 as a whole, by that point you had already had Christian Death, you had already had the Death Rock stuff coming in. A lot of the Cure stuff was very, you know, similar to that, like similar to Archangel well, and things like that. Was, was well, remember Archangel was was written in the Misfits era. Sure. Yeah. All right, because that was written for Dave Vanian from the Dam. Did he ever actually sing that track? No. 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 But. Um, but he heard it, and, yeah. and just nothing came of it. No. So, but Glenn and I were both listening. We were li listening to what they call the Batcave bands back then. Yep. That was the, the thing you know that was going on in England. Specimen, Alien, Sex Fiend, Bauhaus, mm -hmm. of course. So we were we were really into that stuff. So that's kind of where he you know his mind was at that time. He was listening to a lot of that stuff. Yeah. So yep. I always thought that. I actually thought that. Now. We had talked a little earlier about wearing makeup, experimented with makeup. Did you guys, because you don't have it on on the Initium album cover, was it the Initium tour where you started? Just yeah, we just started putting some, you know. Did it last some, long? No. It was just a... Erie did it, I think, more than anybody. You know, he would he would shave his head to have like the Widow's, the Widow's Peak and yeah. whatever. Yeah. So, do you remember the tour itself, the Initium tour, like going yeah, out? Yeah, of course. With, and that that was like your first actual tour. Yeah. Right? Well, you know, it's different. Tours now are our tours now with Dan's are kinda of different than the you know, we bought a we bought an old meat packing truck, three speed, <laughs> right? And went across the country three times. And um yeah, I remember um we played um the night before Thanksgiving in Hollywood and it was two thousand people. And it was like, whoa, this is pretty cool, you know, and that uh, that became that DVD that came out the Sam Hain live at the um, uh, what was that place called? The only Sam Hain DVD. Yeah, yeah, the only yeah. Sam Hain DVD that came out. So that that was that show. And that was that was pretty cool, but yeah, you know, we we went across the U.S. on a truck and and played. Did any of this stuff ever get archived? Anybody film, you know, any live shows aside from what's, you know, what's known, or is that literally all there is? That's it. So nobody filmed any recording sessions. Nobody filmed the any only, other live shows. The only thing that I've seen out there is the Sam Haynes' very first show at the Rock Hotel, mm -hmm. and I've seen that on YouTube. But nothing. There, there's some other stuff that that's playing, but nothing that was professionally done or anything like that. So you guys didn't film anything. No. Nobody took a camera. Nobody filmed shows or unfortunate you know that was before cell phones were around and so it just wasn't a thought to not really archive that stuff no so nothing that you know of in someone's vault somewhere some I don't know. unseen sam hain shows i wish <laughs> i'd like to see it so okay so you did that tour you did the initium tour and now unholy passion comes along um was it another situation where you guys got together again and and wrote the same way. Um, at that time, you know, we were rehearsing at Erie's house, and Glenn would bring down the songs, and we would go over them there. Because they're more, especially drum wise for you. I mean, they're they're more primal. They're more like yeah. He wanted it to drums. be tribal stuff. It was it was really into it. And how did you develop that style? You just did it. <laughs> when Glenn comes out and goes, I want to hear this, and then you got to try to decipher what is this. <laughs> and that's that's how you develop it. So uh, those songs, like you know, with that style of drumming, it was just him saying, "You got to do this," and you just did it. Yeah, and that was it. Why an EP? Why an, why not a full length at that point? Um, uh, he wanted to get something out, and it was it wasn't long after Initium had come out, but we wanted to keep the momentum going. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was like, um, and he had already started writing songs like Twist the Cane and stuff like that. Uh, not long after that, because I remember us trying to practice that um, at a sound check. But uh, yeah, he we just wanted to keep the momentum going, you know. So that, was there anything else recorded during those sessions? No, no, that was it. That was it. So you knew ahead of time we're going to make an EP. Yes. You're going to do five songs. That's it. Um, and you toured behind on Holy Fashion. Mm -hmm. Was the crowd reception at that point? Because now I think people knew. Okay, this is not Misfits Part Two. This is its own entity where people still coming out yelling the Misfits songs. Yeah, of course. More people and, coming out. And, or? you know, it was interesting because, you know, 
this was obviously this was days before the internet and, and and stuff. So, you know, you couldn't hear the band before you got the record, and obviously, you hopefully, you know, we we would get the records press, and then we, you know, you send them out to distributors, and then the distributors had to send them out to the record stores. So it didn't catch on so fast because. It, you know, you didn't have, it wasn't time. Yeah. You know, it took time to, to funnel all the shit through before it reached anyone. What's your favorite track on Unholy Passion? Uh, wow. Probably Unholy Passion itself. So. Yeah. Which recording of it do you prefer? The original that's on the vinyl or the remixed? I like the original. I like the original best. Yeah. Funny story about that. So, we mix it and we go Glenn and I go to the to the um, mastering lab to have it mastered and Glenn's like pump up more bass so the guy's going well I gotta be careful because if I pump up more bass the way albums are made it'll make the grooves jump which will make the record skip so we did it and we did some acetate of it and we brought it to my house and Glenn's like, turn it up. And I turned it up and it blew my fucking speakers. <laughs> Literally blew the speakers out. Wow. So we had to go back and remaster it again. Wow. So, Initium, the, the, the pressing of Initium, it, it was done, that was a Plan 9 release mm -hmm. originally. Okay. The colored vinyl first pressing of that record. The one that goes from, I'm assuming it went black from to white. black to white. So... You want to know how that happened? Yeah, I mean, this is like this important detail okay. right here. This, very simple. This is the most important. It's part very of simple. Thing. We're we're about to embark on our first tour. We need vinyl, right? So. So this is pre-tour. This is this is pre-tour. Okay. Before we, everyone out. We were leaving for tour in a few days. We had no vinyl yet. So this place that I had turned Glenn on to, where I had the Morning Noise record print, printed. Glenn had, uh, the Die Die My Darling was pressed there, and um, we're not getting any callbacks from, from the guy, and we're leaving for tour. So finally, myself, Glenn, and, and um, my friend Joe Olivetti, we drove to Long Island, and the place, there were no cars except for this Jaguar, which was the owner's, and we pounded on that door and we were not leaving and then the, the owner opens the door and Glenn's like we are not leaving until we have fucking albums you promised us this a month ago and we are leaving and the guy's like well no one's here he goes I don't give a fuck we're here turn on those fucking machines or I'm gonna kill you <laughs> so the guy turns on the machines so if you know how um, albums are made, you have basically vinyl pellets, right? They're little vinyl pellets. And they go in this big thing and it turns, you know, comes out in this glob of hot, you know, Wax. waxy vinyl. Mm. So the guy would do that, get put on this machine with the stampers, with the labels, would go like that. Glenn would take that and put it on the, the piece that trims all the extra vinyl, he'd hand it to me, I'd put it in the sleeve, in the jacket, it would go into the machine to to get it uh, shrink wrapped, and Joe would take him, he was putting them in boxes. So, Glenn's like, I want some white vinyl. Guy's like, I can't do that, I have to clean out the whole vat. He goes, don't clean it out. So the guy starts throwing white pellets in there. So. What did you start getting? You started getting some black with the white, then you started getting more marbly, and then it was white with black, you know, and that's how we got that. Do you remember the number? It was about 25. 25. Marble. So 25 came out marble, meaning the gray-ish mm -hmm. marble. I think I have five. So the... Let me see how he is. <laughs> so, so it starts out black. You pressed some black, I'm assuming, right? We, uh, I don't remember the first pressing. I think maybe we did 500. That day? Yeah. The, the day you that did day. them. Okay, so that day you, you pressed some black, mm -hmm. just solid black. 
Then you started adding white into it. It's, it's eerie. <laughs> it's my daughter. Yeah. So some black comes out solid black. Next next step, you added some white in, which created the streak. You know, just a little bit of white in there. Mm -hmm. And there could have been maybe twenty five of those as well, but twenty five actual gray mm -hmm. marble copies. Then eventually it turns to white. Mm -hmm. So that pressing run, uh, do you know the amount that, you know, ballpark? Because it could be, if it's 25 grays, that means what, maybe 50 whites? Yeah, about that. And maybe 50 yeah. streaky yeah. ones? Yeah, if so, not, that, definitely not 50 streaky ones, less than that. So maybe 30, 40 or something? Uh, in the 20s. So you think the number was that small? Yeah, uh, 100, absolutely. 100 total? Yeah. Absolutely. How sure are you of this? I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure. Because it didn't. It, yes, ninety-five percent. Because it didn't take that long to to you know for the stuff to go through the vat. So there was some blacks made, and then you decided after a while you're going to do that run of mm -hmm. black to white. Okay. Um, so that brings us to the end of Unholy Passion. You did that tour. Um, the the white vinyl Unholy Passions. Um, was that Plan 9 released? Yes. You got, so you guys put those out. Mm -hmm. There's only 200 of those? Yeah, something like that. Okay. You never did any other, um, anything like that you know of where he only made, you know, maybe 15 of this or 20 no, of that. No, I don't think At so. that time he hadn't done that. I don't think so. Because there's the pinks, the pink ones, but that was, that was Caroline right. done. That was Caroline. But the white was Plan 9. Mm -hmm. And like 200 of those. Yep. Um, were those sold out on tour? Did you guys take them out on the road with you? Yes. Or was it? Okay, that's what, yep. I, that's what I thought. Um, okay, so you did the Unholy Passion tour, and then you come back from that, and at some point you decide, I'm no longer going to do this, or I'm, I'm out. Behind the music. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> da -da -da. The um, you know, we were in a, it was an interesting time. Uh, we were making some money, but it was... You know, at that point in my life, I think I was 20 years old. And, you know, I didn't know what, what I really wanted to do. And it was kind of an interesting time of the band. I didn't get along with Erie. Gee, surprise, surprise. Ever? But, uh, or just... Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I didn't, I didn't need the ego thing. Uh, that doesn't do it for me. He needed that, I guess. I don't know. Not that I care. But I, at that time, at 20 years old, I, I just... I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure what I wanted. So I left. So It was just that simple. You just called and said, I'm, I'm done. Yeah. I said, call London. He's really, really good. Yeah, absolutely. So you, suggest uh, so you should get that kid London May. Yes, yes. I suggest him. Did you decide at that point you were just going to stop playing music and do something else? I did stop. Just... I, I stopped playing for a while. I actually played with Bobby Steele in The Undead for quite a number of years. Recordings, too. You did yeah, I did that, too. Something like that. I don't try not to remember those times. <laughs> but anyway. So shall we skip The Undead? <laughs> no, no, sure. Do you remember, was that something where... Because I know you did the first, uh, I think it's the first two uh, albums, Undead records. something like that. Yeah. Um, how did you wind up joining, you know, playing him? Was it something where you? So I I was playing with the Undead even before because Bobby had um, Bobby had played on the Morning Noise forty five, and I got to know Bobby then, and his drummer had OD'd. And he needed a drummer, so he called me. And this was actually before Sam Hain started. So it goes way back. And um, he called me, and I'm like, sure. So um, I started playing Chosen because he was paying $50. I was like, great. You know, I'm 19 years old, making 50 bucks. Fucking A. <laughs> this is great. 50 bucks. That's all I needed. Yeah. So that's how I, it started with that. And then it just like... He was doing more and more shows, you know. I'm like, okay. So you just did it more or less just to make 50 bucks and, and play shows. It wasn't more or less like the Misfits connection. No. I, I, 
At first it kind of was, but I, it was fun playing with Bobby, you know, it's just that it was, he was fucking loud and twangy and shit, so it was, it was, was kind of crazy. Gave me tinnitus, actually. No lie. Wow. So you, okay, so when you came off of doing the Sam Hain thing, you did some undead stuff, um, and then I know you did your next project after that. So you continued to play music. You didn't actually stop playing music. You still yeah. I, I I mean, besides Bobby, I did stop for a few years. I just needed, I just you know, just kind of yeah. Hit the reset button. To yeah. Thing. Now your next project after that, when you decided, okay, I'm gonna start playing again. Which was that? What project? Was it was that? China. China. I think. I don't remember. What got you back into playing? Just missed it? My friend Joe, he's like, you know what, let's do something. I'm like, okay. Well, you know. Something, you know, as you grow up, you kind of, some things you, you're not fond of. I wasn't fond of that. It was, it was quite, to me, embarrassing. It's not even on my, on my it's not even on my iPod. <laughs> I, w I, I wouldn't. But it is on your Wikipedia. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Well, whoever did the Wikipedia should take that out. Uh, All right, so we'll skip China. Moving on from there, um, what's the next project that you got involved in? That must have like restarted your interest in playing. Uh, yeah, you know, a point, or? yeah, it was. It, yeah, well, I switched from I started playing drums in China and singing, and then because we couldn't find a singer to sing the songs, so I was drumming and singing. Then I switched to singing because it was easier to find a drummer than it was a singer. Because everybody we would audition to sing. We're trying to sing like like Dio or something. I was like, mm, that ain't gonna work. So um, that's what got me to start singing. So I did that, um, and then after uh, Dan, do you remember what came after that China thing? I don't remember. Well, af after China was the the Doom Tree. Doom oh, Doom Tree. Because I played a, I I recorded a few tracks and did a couple of. I did like one or two things with you. All right, the live Doom, radio. Doom Tree. All right, all right, yeah, China right. And so Doom Tree. So gig. so China ended and formed Doom Tree, and that was uh, with some of the same members, and um, but we were. T it was a much different approach. Um, less keyboard oriented stuff, and more guitar. And then that kind of, that stopped because we had applied for um, trademarks, right, for, yeah. and um, we got them in some odd field. But there was, I bought, I bought the Doomtree.com domain in August of 2001. The, the band, there's a band in Minneapolis, Doomtree. Hip Hop Collective. Yeah. <laughs> And they bought their domain in November of 2001. Now they all, so they knew we existed. They bought Doomtree.net. So um, I still get emails from them every year because I still keep the domain because fuck them. <laughs> like they want to offer me $300. Fuck them. You want it? You want it? $30,000. And they say, we can't afford it. Well, then what kind of band are you? You're not that serious if you can't afford it. So anyway. Um, we started going back and forth. We sent them a cease and desist, right? Mm -hmm. Then we heard nothing. Then they sent this one. They had a friend who went to law school, so he would send a cease and desist. And so every time some a lawyer sends you something, you have to respond. So now we get our lawyer, and now it's costing us. It's starting to cost us money. Yeah. And it was like, you know what? It's not worth it. Did you make a record? Did you actually? Yeah, well, yeah, we did a yeah, we did a CD. Absolutely, we had, we were on a label. And a Christmas promo. And a Christmas promo. Yeah, we were in all the Tower Records, Virgin Records, and those they had those listing stations. We were in all those across the country. It was, yeah, it was fun. It was a fun thing. We mixed it out in California. So you did one record with the Doom Tree, mm -hmm. and then you. And then we. So then it morphed into Marriage Drug, um, and we did one. Was that the same band lineup? Yeah. Same guys. Yeah, it was just, the same lineup. Just to get out of the hassle. Just to get out of the hassle. I wasn't going to spend any more money on lawyers. It wasn't worth the fight. 
So you did the one record with them. Yeah. And it morphed into that. Yeah. And then, is that around the time where you did the Sam Hain reunion? Or? No, China was the Sam Hain reunion. Okay. Yeah. How did that come about, the Sam Hain reunion? Uh, I had been in California, and I went to Glenn's office, the Verotic office, and we were just talking about, you know, he was in the midst of making Dantic Six, and he'd say, you know, it'd be cool if we did a tour where, you know, we came out and we did some Sam Hain stuff. And that's how that started. But no, but it was just, we'll do some Sam Hain shows, not put Sam Hain back together and maybe make a record. Was no, that ever no. talked about? Mm -hmm. Nothing like that. No. It was just... Just do shows. We'll do some shows. Was it kind of the promote, was that around the time the box set came out? Uh, box set didn't come out so way later. Way later, yeah. Okay, so you did those shows, got back together, did them, and it was just was that all it was meant to be? It was just a brief, yeah, thing, and that was it. Yep. And then from there, you went to Doom Tree, did that stuff. Well, and then of course, Son of Sam. Son of Sam. Now, when uh, you, you forgot one. No, no, I remember that. One. I'm staring at it. <laughs> I can't miss that. That used one. to be in Tower Records. Son of Sam. Um, I'm assuming you met, you, you must have met Todd and, and, um... Todd was, Todd played in both Dan's again, the Sam Hain 99 thing. Um, so, and then Davey Havoc, uh, AFI had, had opened up for half the tour. So that's how, and London was friends with Davey, so that's how that came about. So, after, I don't know, months after, um... London and I guess Davey and Todd we were all you know kind of talking and and it'd be it'd be great to do a record so we were actually going to hit up Devil Man to put out a 45 for us right because he had a good job so but then Davey spoke to um, to the uh, they were on Nitro Records which is owned by Dexter Holland the singer for The Offspring so um, he talked to Dexter. And he's like, well, why don't you just do a full-length album? So we went and did an album. We did it in a weekend. Now, did you know that you were going to, it was going to be like a Sam Hain style album? That's where Son of Sam came from, the song? Yeah, I mean, like you, you know. Whose decision was that to make it? It just morphed into it. Just from talking about it, freaking you in London. Todd. And been a part of Sam Hain previously. Todd's a great guitar player. Todd's got a very good, when it comes to like songs and stuff, he's very... Todd, can, Todd, it's kind of interesting. Todd can kind of morph into whatever uh, whatever genre he's like wants to sway to. He's good like that. So you got together, record. You record that record in a weekend. Yeah. No, and, and then Davy came in. Davy had no idea because we, you know, the demos that would go back and forth via cassette, right? Pre MP3s. Um, Davey got the same cassettes we did, and we went in the studio. Davey wasn't even there when we went in the studio. So we went in, say, on a Friday. Davey flew in on Saturday to do his vocals. He, what, what was on the, on the tapes was exactly what he had to sing to. Did someone give him a tape to say this is how it's got to sound? or he After just... tapes going back and forth, that's exactly what happened. I mean, you know. So it was that quick? Yeah. How did Glenn get involved in it? Todd asked him. Just because he plays guitar on the on track. That's the keyboards. The keyboard? I don't, I don't know. So Todd just said, would you play on this record? And Glenn said, okay. Yeah. So he was supportive of it. Yeah. It's a Sam Hain style yeah, record. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. So you put that record out, the label, mm -hmm. put it out. It's on 50 million different colors. I don't even want to get into pressing on that because there's... Yeah, I got them all. Yeah, there's a lot. I have test pressings too. Cha-ching, <laughs> cha-ching. Yeah. Speaking of which, you should probably get a shot of that. <laughs> this is going tonight. We have uh, we have a few hours left for this. This is a this is a Steve uh, Zing auction show right there. I am um, um, I'm auctioning this for to feed the hungry and the homeless. I've been doing it. This is the third year now, and um, so I'm auctioning this off. This is very rare. There's only like two of these made, this color. So um, I've been trying to do it because, um, you know, it's just the right thing to do to try, try to help people out. And because there are people that don't have the simplest things like food. 
So if you can help somebody out and, and hopefully they realize that they were helped and when they get back on their feet, they help somebody down the road. That's all you can do. So the auction ends tonight, but this is up to $2,300. So the goal is uh, between that and some photos of early misfit stuff, we're going to raise, you know, over 3000 uh, We have private donations coming in uh, via PayPal, which is great, you know, just to try to help people out. Now, on these, the ski boards, Glenn screened yeah. the Sam Haynes ski mm -hmm. boards. So, Son of Sam, you put that out. Um, was there a good reaction to it from Sam Hain fans and stuff? It was. I mean, we. Uh, it was kind of interesting the way it came out. Um, they, I think the guys in AFI were, they were kind of jealous. Because we were supposed to do a video, we were supposed to do a handful of shows, and nothing ever happened. And those guys didn't want Davey part of it. And that was right before they left Nitro to go to, I guess, Geffen or whatever label they were on. And um, what's when they had the Girls Not Grey record. And um, so I went out to um, the record label. It was the day after Easter. And I got sat there and I did press. Because I was the only one doing press myself in London. Todd was off with Danzig, and it was just me in London doing press, and um, we sold enough where we recouped. We cool. recouped, and it came out. It came out a few days after Easter. So when did you do the second record? Two thousand seven. Two thousand seven. Two thousand eight. I think it was early two thousand eight. Um. Was a kind of like a. Uh, I wanted to do another one because I enjoyed it. London didn't want to have a part of it because Davy. Davy couldn't do it. Davy uh, again. I don't think his guys wanted him to do it. They were already kind of successful with AFI. I think his contract, besides him being able to do black audio, whatever it was called, um, he couldn't really do anything else. He had a ton of stuff going on. He had a clothing company. He was doing all kinds of different shit. So he really didn't want to be part of it. So London's like, well, I don't want to do it then. So I did it. I kind of put a little rift between London and I. Um, maybe I should have never done it. Probably wasn't right. Although I think the singer did a great job on it. I there's a bunch of songs I like on it. Obviously, it's very different than what how Davey approached it. But I, I still thought it was a decent album. But, you know, maybe London was right. I mean, who knows? So what led to you getting back in, you know, in with the modern Danzig and playing in Danzig currently? I was going through a divorce. Do you remember when I got the call? Yeah. So we were at our guitar player for Marriage Drug, this guy, Steve Falco, that I lived with I was going through a divorce and I was actually moving stuff into I was I lived with this guy for almost two years and I um, we were moving stuff of mine clothes and stuff to this guy's house and I remember um, getting a phone call from Glenn and he says hey um, gonna do a tour next month or in two months I'm like yeah he goes I fired my bass player I don't have one. I go, I don't know any. He goes, what about you? I'm like, me? He goes, you could do it. You did Sam Hain stuff in 99. I'm sure you can do it. And I'm like, well, when is it? So he gave me the date. And I'm like, shit, that's when I'm getting divorced. Let me call my lawyer tomorrow and see if I can move the date up. So I actually had to move the divorce date up. You got the call to, uh, to play bass in Danzig. He said you could do it. I didn't even own a bass. He loaned me one, he helped me figure out a bunch of songs, and then uh, I met with Johnny and um, Kenny, Kenny Hickey from Typo, uh, we would go down, Dan would come with me, we would go down Brooklyn. to their rehearsal thing in, in Brooklyn, and we would rehearse there, and we did that, uh, I don't know, four or five times, I think, yeah. and um, that was it. That's it, you just, and then just stayed. 
was it originally you know you're joining Danzig or was it no you're just it, it was that, I was just doing the tour and then at the end of the tour Glenn's like you did pretty good if you want the gig you got it I'm like okay it was uh, it was it was an interesting time of my life again go I just got divorced literally a few weeks before the tour started and um, it was kind of like figuring out like all right how do I do this like how do I date a girl well you don't have to worry about it on tour it just kind of <laughs> happens naturally <laughs> if you know what I mean <laughs> but uh, you know I've been married and with the same girl for 18 years so what do I know like riding a bike that's sure. what they say so you went on tour and you just kind of, you just stayed, you became the... Yeah, the, they, they, he kept me. Well, what Glenn liked was that there was no drama. There was no drama with me and Johnny. We just liked to have a good time. Did you know him previously? Johnny? Johnny? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, not well, but he's become one of my best friends. Um, but, um, um, you know... I'm a fortunate person that that can pick and choose my friends, and I pick them wisely. And I have a small small group of friends, which probably I can. It's less than five fingers that I choose to be involved with. Mm -hmm. And obviously, Dan is like my brother, uh, the brother from another mother. But I have a very small group of friends that I pick because. A, I don't trust a lot of people, and, and B, you know, these are people that really mean something to me and are dear to my heart. And they're, you know, they're, they're real people. So, but, um, you know, um, yeah, so there's been no, there's no, there's no bullshit, you know, in Danzig. It just, it kind of works. It, it's great, you know. If we don't play for a year and we get back into a room, it just flows. It just goes. So, where did the idea come from to do the Sam Hain reunion this time, the 30th anniversary? Well, the, it was the uh, guys from Riot Fest, and they were big fans. Obviously, I mean, they obviously we did well. We did Legacy first, yep. uh, and we um, we did that, and then two years ago. Um, I got a call from Glenn. It was, it was, had to be like April, and he's like, "Hey, we got, you know, got an offer to do a thirty that the guys from Riot Fest are, you know, they're big Sam Hain, the the Misfit fans, and we got an offer to do Sam Hain. Like Sam Hain is, like, they're like, yeah, they were. He reminded us that it was a 30, 30 year. I'm like, oh yeah, I guess you're right. So I'm like, okay, so now we needed we needed a guitar player. Being that London and I would trade off on bass and drums like we did in 99, so now we needed a guitar player. So there were many people that kind of went through everyone's minds on, on who would do who could do it. Um, I guess that Dave Grohl was one of them and it was all kinds of people. And uh, it was Randy from Lamb of God who turned us on to, to Peter Adams from Baroness because um, he was a Sam Hain fan. And when he was in high school, they, he had a Sam Hain tribute band. Right. So that's, that's why we picked Peter, whose band just got nominated for a Grammy. Wow. Was the original lineup ever considered for that? Since the 30th anniversary of Initium? No. no. <laughs> just no. No. Okay. Look, you, you know, there, there's, there, there's things that, uh, there's things worth not discussing because, you know, sometimes there, things happen, right, in any kind of relationship, whether it's a band, a, a you know, sometimes they could be worked out, in this case, like the Misfits had their reunion, and sometimes they just can't. And sometimes you just have to take what was left. And London had a big part of being in Sam Hain, as well as myself and Glenn. And at the end of the day, we're going to listen to Glenn's songs, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing with the Misfits. 
So, um, there is, uh, sometimes it's not worth revisiting some of the old things because there's just too much, um, there's too much baggage that goes along with it. No hard feelings. I know there was all kinds of shit being talked about from f former members and it's like, whatever. We went out and we had a good time. That's all that matters. I think we, I think we... We satisfied some people, so mm -hmm. that's, what we, that's what we wanted to do. So how was it during Dan the Danzig Legacy tour, you, Glenn, Doyle, going out on stage playing some of them old classic Misfits songs? Oh, for me, I was in heaven. You know what it's like to, to play with your idols? That's what it was like for me, and playing those songs that I grew up on, that I would sit on the, 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 the roof of the garage to listen to them play those songs, and I got to play those on stage in front of thousands of people. Was there ever anything during those times that you wanted to play that Glenn was just like, no? Of course, we all did. You know, um, which we got to play a bunch when we did the um, the Danzig Legacy live thing in the round. You know, which was great to play things like Come Back and stuff like that. It was unbelievable. One of the best nights of my life, musically. know Steve Zing and I want to make sure that you know him so introduce yourself. Let's I am uh, Dano, Dan. Uh, Dan Tracy. Dan um, Dan played with me in Doomtree and Marriage Drug and uh, when that kind of um, went its way um, we c I kind of stood there because I had only written songs in the uh, Marriage Drug and Doomtree with the guitar player and um, again, like a Glenn situation, we'd bring it down and we would work on it collectively as a band. But for the most part, it was just myself and the guitar player. So when that kind of imploded, um, Dan and I looked at each other and said, well, all right, he would come down. You know, let's, let's try to record something. Yeah, I basically, he, he told me, he said, the, the drummer and the guitar player, they quit. You know, we either we things didn't happen the way they envisioned or, mm -hmm. you know, and fame didn't come or something like that. And I said, well, I'm on this train until it stops. And that's where we picked it up. Yeah, so we came down and, and you know, I have a riff or Dan has a riff and we start going, okay, let's do it like this. Now, again, Dan is a, a, an amazing bass player. And when, when Dan... Um, when I first started playing with Dan, I remember we had a meeting at a diner. And I said, Dan, you're a great bass player, but I don't need a great bass player. I just need a good bass player. You know, because he comes from a prog background. And, well, you know, he's, he's, he, he likes music with no hooks, with no chorus. Doodling. I can't, I can't do that. I'll, I'll rip my head off. So, um, but when we got together down here to, right you know he knows the way i i hear things right and i tell him and i'll hum it i go and I'll, or he'll start playing something and i go no mm -mm, no just like this but it's it comes from a very simplistic form right there's not much my whole thing is i like to layer right you need room you need room for the vocals you need room and he got that and so we did the first song and we listened back and we're like you know what? That's pretty fucking good. So, and then we continued. Yeah, no, because I had, uh, I started out on bass when I was 15, but I had played instruments before that because I come from a musical family. And, uh, but I always played guitar in the basement and at home and when I do my own demos and I write my own music and things like that. And, uh, but what I would do wouldn't necessarily fit the way I had it into the things that we were doing over the years, you know, and um, so this was like my debut on guitar, and like, and I, I have plenty of guitars and stuff because I play at home and stuff. So this this for me was uh, a chance to just play, and you know, just get out the ideas and stuff, and uh, like I said, bounce off ideas off of Steve and back and forth and things, and that's good, that's not good. At first, it was frustrating because you know, trying to figure out. 
what he was hearing in his head and trying to get it to me and then get those two things to mesh the way it should be. And then after a while, it was just that there's no agenda other than how can we make this the best song. Like in, 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 in the previous bands we, we did together, it was always go, the, the drummer going, I don't hear the drums loud enough, the guitar player going, I don't hear the guitar loud enough. Well, in this situation, we're listening for the song. I just want it to drive. I need it to drive, and I need it. I need it to where I don't lose focus. I don't lose. Now, this is one of the only things that I can listen to over and over because I have ADHD plus Supreme, whatever it is. I like if, if I'm on a treadmill with with my iPod, I'll go through 200 songs in 20 minutes because I can't listen to something completely through. I don't have that patience, so I'll go to the next thing. This is the only thing I can listen to over and over and over. It satisfies the ADHD crowd. So you you did uh, what was it an EP first? No, which one? No, no. Oh, they're both lines. So they yeah. so because you would release the song first, like as a yes. teaser. Okay. Yep. Uh, we did uh, uh, Sweet Nothing with a video. Yep. And so we put these out. So we did a limited edition. Uh, this artist Dave Burns. And so we did a limited edition of this. Also um, available as a t-shirt. That's right. So we did that, and then we did the cover. So just two different covers. Yes. One has a UPC, right? <laughs> One doesn't. For collectors, yeah. Uh -huh. So yeah. how many were pressed? I mean, that's the real uh, This was 200, and this was 500. So this is the one, this is the more rare one. And I'm giving it to you. Merry Christmas. Thank you, Steve. I'll be playing this on the show for sure. And, um, but yeah, so uh, Johnny plays on four tracks, right? I think so. Yeah, I think so. Three or four or something. I don't remember now. Um, and uh, we also did a duet uh, with this girl, a friend of ours, uh, Liana from Philadelphia. And um, we did a cover of... Um, the song from 1980 called I Know There's Something Going On, which was the girl from ABBA had did the song, and I, I love the song back in, when it came out, so I always wanted it to do it, so. Frida, right? Frida. 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 Mm -hmm. Is that on here? That's, That's on, on there. there. So, this record's available now. You can get this. How do people get this? Because I know that there's... Black29.com. Black29.com. Mm -hmm. Is there plans? Or iTunes, Amazon, all that. So it's everywhere. It's yeah. everywhere. So are there plans to do a follow-up to this record? It's already Absolutely. in the works. We're all, it's already in the works. We have two songs recorded. Um, as I told you before, Dan had some health issues, quadruple bypass. It actually, it's funny because a few days before he actually found out, uh, we were down here recording. Yeah. Wow. And that's actually on Facebook. That's right. He did a Facebook Live on me while I'm doing solos, and I didn't even know it, and just in this again and again, and I'm just like, oh. So th this poor guy needing, has, has four valves that are blocked, you know. Yeah, my arteries, and, yeah. Yeah, so uh, he's, he's a pretty lucky guy to wow. be sitting here yeah. today. Because I was, that, that particular week, uh, I, was, I, I always walk. It was in the summertime, and I'm, I'm, I'm walking, and I was helping a friend of mine work. I'm up and down ladders. I'm drilling holes in walls. I'm putting pavers in in my backyard. We did a wedding. We worked. We, you know, because always, he always works. It's, it's I do sound. They, yeah, and so I was, you know, helping out and stuff like that, you know, and I'm, and I was just walking along, and all of a sudden I'm like, oh, ow. And then it went away. And next day I'm out and I'm doing stuff again and I went, ooh, ow. And I made a phone call and the next week they told me basically, hey, you need at least triple bypass. And I said, okay, let's get it done. And then next Monday it was done. A week later I'm out of the hospital. So, and, uh, so I'm doing really well. And uh, make sure you get your blood checked. Make sure you go to your doctors. Don't be a man child. And... You know, say I can do this, and uh, and everything's been good. But uh, that's it, onward and upward. Damn, glad you're still here, man. And uh, I got so, if you watch the thing on Facebook, and if you see me yeah, going like this, it's not days, it's not because yeah. of, it's not because of the heart. It's because wow. of getting the feeling out of the note. 
So sweet nothing. Um, what what made you decide? That, did you decide? Okay, I'm gonna be. I'm gonna sing on this. Was that? Or did well, I you... sung. I, I played some guitar. I played um, drums. You know, on all the tracks except for the ones that Johnny did. Um, I feel comfortable as a singer now. Um, Sweet Nothing's probably the best song I've ever heard you do. That song is incredible, man. It sounds like the cult. It sounds like a really well, good cult song. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. I don't, you know, it's kind of weird because, uh, well, I guess maybe that's uh, a compliment. I don't ever look at... Um, the cult is not, I don't really think, is an influence of mine. I like the cult, but they're not an influence well, of mine. Well, they were goth when Sam Hain was starting. They were. Well, Glenn and I did see Southern Death Cult. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, not, nothing that I actually remember. Um, but, um, you know, I, I guess that's happened. good. I don't know. Just, it just it happens. Just the way it we, we, again, as Dan said, there's no formula for this. We just go in and we sing. And we, it's like, I mean, saying we we just we just kind of play, and I'll say, hey, I got this, and he, and we we start on that, and then we go, then then I'll, I'll be behind the drums and playing, and then we'll we'll play it over and over, and then I'm like I'll stop, and I'll get it, I'll grab the acoustic while he's got the electric, and we're where we're gonna we're gonna go from where can we go from here? Let's try this, and that's how we go, and then so eventually the lyrics. lyrics. Who's the who puts the lyrics? Me. Down? Where does it come from? Um, what are you writing about on Black Twenty Nine? Well, that that's that's actually a personal album that had to do with a lot of stuff um, that happened the past ten years in my life of of relationships and blah 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 blah, you know. But it, it just life stuff. Where's the name come from? Um, it's it's actually so uh, twenty nine is my birthday, and I love gambling. So black twenty nine. That's my. Yeah, that was because. As long as I've known him, when, even when we went out and did shows as Doom Train and Marriage Drug, we'd stop in places and we did we did a couple times in Vegas and stuff. And uh, we're hanging out and he'd been out and gambling, walking around. I don't gamble because I'm just like, yeah. it takes too long to make the money. Sure. And uh, so he's just like, come on, let's go out. You know, what are we doing sitting around in a hotel room and stuff like that? And he was playing, it was Black 29. And he always seems to be fairly successful with that. So we were just sitting down here thinking about names and stuff and for years we were so just called Zing, you know, and he didn't want to do that. And then I said, well, why don't you call it Black 29 because you're like, you know, successful and you know, you, you had luck with it, so maybe we'll have luck with this. And that was That's fine because cool. like, me personally, I don't care what anything is called, you know. It's just, At one time I wanted to have We were going to call it Bon Jovi, but that was taken. Yeah. yeah. At one time because of my last time, I wanted to have Zing. a band Dan called Zing. Tracy's Lords. You know, I was going to put a band together, but that's an ah. But anyway, but, uh, you know, it's, like, as I was telling you before, it's like this was probably, like, the least stressful, painful anything musically I've ever done. Because we just kind of bounce stuff off each other, work together. Like, he, he, I'm, I'm not doing it out of ego. You're not doing it out of ego. Whereas, like, the other times, like, in, in the last thing that we had, because other people were very interested in what they were doing, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I, I would be relegated to going like, doom, 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 doom. like I had no, there was no nothing I could do. Yeah, you know, and sometimes it would be frustrating and stuff. But. Well, and you know, it becomes, um, it becomes this musical masturbation thing. Then, and I don't like that. Again, I can't keep focused on stuff like that. You know, that's like it, like that's like dream theater. That's to me. That's like watching grass grow. I was like, get, get to the fucking <laughs> chorus already. I I can't deal with like you know, but that's that's the genre I grew up on. It was like you know, Ramones and Misfits. It was like, give me the hook, give me the get get there already. You know, no yeah. time, no time to waste. And I'm the polar opposite. Right. Of of yeah, just saying you get a prog rock background yeah. and stuff. Yeah. No, I was I for for years. And as he said, I came from a cover band background. For years and years and years, and then uh, and then I was in some original bands. I was in an original like an ELP band. Wow. You know, guy with eleven keyboards and guy with like twenty-two piece drum kit and stuff. We had <laughs> we had pieces that would go for forty-three minutes and movements oh, and, wow. and you know all that kind of stuff. And and I I just I just loved all that stuff, and I still do. I still I still love all that stuff. But 
the thing is, is that if you're writing music, if you're creating music, if you're doing stuff, if you're working with somebody, it's not about dig me. It's about what what can we do to take this and then just elevate it as much as we can. And because, and we've talked about it because we, we both do sound and stuff, it's, like, it's about your ears. And his ears are different than my ears, but we have a similar taste in certain things. Like, Dan is really good, like, he's be also become one of my favorite guitar players. Because, and this was a side I didn't know of him until we started this recording process together. And, and, and he would start coming up with these things. And then again, like I said, I hear things in my head. I know what, I know what the song is good, supposed to be, so it's supposed to sound like. As soon as I say, hey, play this, right? And we play the drums. I already know what I envision. And then when we, he starts like with the overdubs and the leads, and he starts playing it, I'm going, holy shit, that's, that's great, right? So, um, again, we're not, we're not playing, he's not playing to say, look at me, hear me. It's just about the song. That's all it's about. Yeah, and most of the time, I mean, I can work on something at home for a little bit, like, oh, I'll, I'll, a little intro or a little whatever, but... To be honest, most of the stuff that's on it is spontaneous because of the energy that he has at that moment and what he's hearing. And you start to come up and go, okay, I, that's good, that's good, that's what it is. So then, you, because if you have something that's completely worked out and you come down and it's not going to be right, you're going to get pissed. Right, because I, I don't, I don't, right. And I, we don't, him and I don't have to walk on eggshells. For, around each other, because if I don't like it, I'm going to tell him I don't like it, and he'll go, "Okay, what are you, what are you thinking?" And I go, "No, no, no, no," you know, and I'll, and then he's got to, <laughs> he's got to take that, no, 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 and kind of figure that out. Um, but what what he's really good at is getting the most out of my vocals, you know, and he'll say, "No, no, that's that's that you could, I know you could do better. You can do it like this," and so it, it works really well. So. Yeah, and, and vocally sometimes, like, um, in some ways, like when you talked about Glenn being a crooner and singing, mm -hmm. and a lot of, Steve has that capability, he has that thing he grew up with listening to singers, and, and when you talked about the cult influences, that even back when, when we first met, uh, when we first met, actually, I was playing in a cover band, and we were working at the same place, and he would come in and he'd play all the punk songs, which I had to learn. You know, we we would do like this punk set. He gave him, so that's how we became friends. And even then, when I first got introduced to him and was playing music with him, he sounded to me like a combination. Like there's definitely like a crooner, like an Elvis. There's a little bit of Glenn because he was such an influence on him growing up. Yep. And I could get a little of the of the Ian Asbury only because Ian Asbury sounds like Glenn. Yeah. Sounds like Elvis. Sounds Jim like Morrison. Jim Morrison. Yeah. That kind of thing. And he just has this energy in his voice and really expressive, very emotive, and at times like incredibly powerful. Like, you know, he can just really get that force and that energy out. And it's no BS. He's not sitting there going like, oh, okay, I'm going to be like this. He just comes out and he sings. And his way of recording is very, very different than most people. He'll start off and he'll warm up and he's like, I got a better one. I got a better one like that and there's some things that he does I said that's amazing keep that don't change that and then move on that so it's not about dig me it's right about it's, what's and the it's best. not pre-planned because I don't I don't like that I don't like I don't want to um, none of our stuff was ever we ever rehearsed it and then no. decided we were going to record it and when we've had Johnny come down to do the the four tracks that he played on he had no idea what he was going to play and I play him the riff and go Play something. Like what? I don't know. Just play. Be Johnny Kelly. Sure. You know, and Johnny's one of my favorite drummers. Why? Because Johnny swings. He's a swinger. He's like, you know, he's just, he's just got this thing. It goes. So when we did the Frida song, I did send Johnny a demo of what I was playing on it. And I just said, just here's the, here's the basis of the song, just to capture what the feel that we were trying to go for but he came down I go just play here's the here's 
here's the speed of the song, but just just play, do your thing. I don't, you know. Yeah. Yeah, so. and once you get the performance, then you can just build on it. It's it's like building a house. It's like building anything. Once you get that foundation, then it's easy to to build up from there. And like we can do whatever we need to do around a really good performance, no matter who it is, whether it's him or me or whatever. And then just kind of, as you said, layer it, color it in. And that's how I look at songs. I look at songs like a coloring book. Mm -hmm. You know, you you say you, you have your page, right? So that's your foundation. And then you start, you start playing or painting or whatever. And that's how I look at it. So it's, it's a little nice little tree over here. Bob Ross, the thing. little cloud. <laughs> Some so is this new one gonna have other special guests on, or is it just gonna be you guys? Um, I don't know. Not sure yet. I'm not sure yet. We, you know, we'll see. It also depends on who's around, who's in, yeah. who's available. I, I, you know, I have some ideas already. You know, like I, would, I love Johnny to come and play on. You know, so we'll see. But it's in the works. Absolutely, it's in the works. Very cool. Black Twenty Nine. Check it out. Black Twenty Nine dot com, and um, iTunes, Amazon, all those usual spots. And uh, definitely listen to this because I highly recommend it. Seriously. I've heard well, the Sweet Nothing, and if you just need the teaser just to prove that you need to go buy this, pick up, you know, take a listen to Sweet Nothing. It's, it's fantastic. So on YouTube. It's on YouTube. <laughs> well, I, you know, look, the, the other thing about, about this CD is that, you know, I don't, it's, to me it's not overproduced. Um, it's just trying to get back to some of the roots uh, of music where we can actually go perform this and make it sound good. And it's not something that, you know, is... Is there something you want to do? You want to go... Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, we will. Good. Uh, absolutely will. But, um, yeah, so, I don't know. I'm proud of it. And it's probably one of the most... Um, um, one of the best things that I've ever done. It's, it's very... It's one of the most satisfying things I've ever done. So... You can listen to it every day. I listen to it every day. I can. Even with the ADHD plus. <laughs> That's me. Where does the zing come from? Ah. Somebody asked me that the other day. All right. So, when we were kids, we used to make, um, we used to screen print our own shirts. Right? So, when you would clean the screen, you needed this stuff. So, there used to be a chain of, uh, of uh, hardware stores called Pergament. Pergament sold this stuff. It was kind of like a turpentine. Like an acetone. Right. It was called Zing. So it was called. So I would buy that to clean the screens, but I love the way it smelled. And I would take that. Now, I don't do drugs. I never did drugs, but I would take this out and go, oh, that smells so good. So a friend of mine says, I'm going to call you Steve Zing. And that's where it came from. <laughs> Don't do this at home, kid. No, you see stars. <laughs> and there it is. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Dano. Absolutely. It's Black 29. Pick this up. Never say never. That's his favorite saying. What about Sam Hain? You think they'll ever be anymore? Never say never. What about Black 29? You think they'll be another record? Absolutely. Ah, oh, absolutely. What about Son of Sam with Davey Havoc? Another record? Never say never. <laughs> I, I, I can't, I, you know. I, who knows? I mean, look, to say the Misfits would reunite after 33 years? Yeah. Or are you playing, you know, an issue after 30 years? That's even crazier.